right, so, so far we've had a look at uh, what risks are out there. We've had a look at what risks we want to work with and, and reduce. The question is now, how are we going to reduce those risks? What, what are we going to do to actually control and, and make sure that the issues we're wanting to address are properly addressed? So there's a, going to be a, a planning process, a planning step to decide exactly what to do. We know where the are, problems are, we know that's too big to live with, uh, how are we going to address them? So again, in, act, in process three of plant wellness, it's going to be looking at things in fairly fine detail to understand where the situations arise that then lead to problems for us. When it comes to early in the, early in the life cycle, we've had a look yesterday at this optimization process. So I didn't mention its name was actually called the doctor. This, this loop we have a look at when things are on the, on the drawing board, we look at what, the what if scenarios of risk. Uh, I call it the design and operations cost totally optimised risk. So DOCTOR is the acronym and we reserve that for the design phase of the life cycle. Literally we're going to ask if this bearing and that pump fails, what does it mean for the business? What operational risks are we carrying because of the selection we've made? If that risk is too much and we can't reduce that with our strategies of maintenance and operations, then we're going to go back and look at the design and, and find a, a better machine with, a, with less chance of failure. So that one there is um, the early life considerations. Most companies, of course, are already in business. So we're going to have to look at handling situations in companies as they are now. And this is the other leg we come down here, existing plant and operations. What can we do today in this plant that's been already in operation for a number of years to reduce the risk and change the future for this business? This is that box there analysing risk controls available to us. There's a couple of techniques, one of which is already well established, the FMECA, Failure Mode Effect Criticality Analysis, that see the criticality we have done in the previous step. So we're not going to go and repeat that, we'll just take the criticality into the FMECA. FMECA is also part of the RCM methodology, so it's well practised, well understood, very effective process. So I'd be happy that people use FMEA to, to analyse what controls to apply. The hassle with FMEA is it is not a life cycle approach. It is only what we can do now at this point in time with the current situation. I wanted to have one more process which covered the complete life cycle because if I can stop the problems at the design phase early in the life of that plant then I've saved that plant many many years of problems. And FMEA doesn't do that, it just tells us what we can do with our current constraints. And that cycle, that process of having a look at the whole life cycle opportunities is RGCA, Reliability Growth Cause Analysis. Reliability is manageable, it's a choice we make. So I can grow reliability by the choices I use to minimise the risk that leads to the failure that we don't want to have. So I've got two techniques, so FMEA I won't go into because there's plenty of data around, Good process, takes a bit of time. Uh, it is a brainstorming based process, which means we've got a risk of missing important issues. So if I'm going to do an FMEA and uh, I'm also going to have a, a brainstorming team, plus I'm going to have my list of other uh, physics of failure type causes. So we don't forget the things that could occur and now the team sees the whole picture as opposed to just what they know is possible. Uh, our GCA we'll have a look at a bit later on. The whole point we're trying to achieve is is what to do to eliminate defects and prevent failure. What's the proactively thing to do? And we're going to write that up and script this whole story out. So, and the other side is in the existing plant, what can we do to manage our current risks? So I'm going to have two strategies. One is to prevent defects arising because they will become breakdowns later on. And in the current equipment I've got, what plans can I apply to minimise existing risk. Out of that will come our, our quality management system, our accuracy controlled process and activities. Operations will be affected, maintenance will be affected and of course engineering and selection will be affected and all of this is going to be based upon the financial benefits. There's no point doing any of this unless there's payback. So we're going to use our total cost impact and justify doing these changes because there's real money there to be made. When it comes to minimising risk, it's, it's worth understanding our choices that we, we can work with. 
I've got up here the risk equation. Risk is chance times consequence. And there's probably only a couple of categories that we can define or we can put our options into. All the things we do in a business, all the things we do in maintenance, all the things we do in operations, we can categorise either as consequence reduction choice and strategies or a chance reduction strategies. So what I've done here is have a look at a, a range of tools and techniques and methods that we've used across industry for a long, long time now and categorise them into either reducing the losses should an event occur or preventing the event in the first place. Condition monitoring, we do condition monitoring to look for the P point, to find the beginnings of degradation. So condition monitoring is a consequence reduction strategy. We are looking for signs of a breakdown before the breakdown occurs, then we do plant maintenance before um, we lose the, the plant. So we haven't stopped the failure, we've simply found the evidence of a failure becoming a problem for us. Uh, same with um, risk-based inspections. Now, when we go out and monitor our operating vessels, our, our pipelines, our, our boilers, looking for evidence of degradation, we are looking for signs of a problem. When we find the problem, we say, oh, there's a problem here. Let's address that. So we don't prevent the problem. We simply look for evidence of it becoming, of it, of it starting, and then prevent it becoming a disaster to us. So this box here on, the, on, the, on this side is all about finding an issue before it becomes a serious consequence, addressing it uh, as a planned action. So I'm not stopping a failure, I am reducing the consequence of that failure. This one over here on the other side is different. This is about saying, what if a situation arises, um, what will I do to prevent that occurring? So things like FMECA, it's about brainstorming what can go wrong? And yes, that can happen in this business. Those bearings can fail from uh, overload, from misalignment, from soft foot problems. In that case, if that can happen, let's proactively put into place the right things to, to minimise that chance. Uh, HAZOP, Hazard Operability Studies, done at the design phase of, uh, of process uh, and plant designs, is about understanding what are the hazards this design is giving the operating people. Let's recognise them now on the design drawing board and remove those hazards as part of our actual uh, process of building this and, and designing this plant. So this set of activities that we've been doing now for a long time is about reducing the chance of a situation arising to become a possible failure we then have to fix and spend money on. So supply and chain management. This is the idea that DuPont used earlier on. Let's go into our supply chain and get our supply chain people to not give us defects. Make sure we get quality product and control that supply chain process proactively so the defects that come into our business that we now have to fix never get there because we stop them at this phase. So we are going to work very hard on preventing problems. We're going to use a lot of these techniques that are chance reduction techniques in favour of consequence reduction techniques. Now the truth is I've got to be good at both. You know, I've got to find the problem before it breaks because the breakdown is expensive. So I want to use these strategies and not forget about them, but they are not going to be my main drivers. These are my plan B, my backup if these techniques fail. But I want to be proactively ahead of the problem and design my processes to prevent those events that lead to breakdowns even occurring. So I'm going to move my business into this world here, to this world where when we do our work, we do it to increase reliability, to minimise future problems. This side here is all about minimising the loss. We haven't stopped the failure, we just reduced the losses of that event. Here, we're not going to have the event in the first place. So I want to move our business into this world, because this is where the money is. This one here, I'm just the average company here. So again, we are going to follow a fairly simple process. The equipment, uh, the asset in our business, the criticality and the costs that are there if things go wrong. We know we're going to have to deal with the parts. You know, we want to prevent parts failure because the parts fail, the machine stops, the process stops, the business stops. So everything hangs off the parts being reliable. So that comes down to understanding what can make a particular part in this machine fail 
And what do I have to do proactively so it never happens? Out of which will come a whole bunch of engineering issues, operating issues, maintenance issues, financial issues, capital expenditure issues, and future plans of the business type issues. So I want to have all those come to the surface. I want to know all my options, and then we're going to talk and say, what's the optimal choices for us? Where's the payback? Well, let's have the risk matrix and place these options on the risk matrix and see which way the risk moves. So out of that will come a whole bunch of factors affecting the life cycle, affecting our sparing selections, uh, affecting our procedures and the training we give our people and the selections of people we actually make in the first place. Um, the skills and resources required and of course even the condition monitoring. You know? We don't want to forget about that, that is valuable, but I don't want to count on that uh, to save the business because it won't make the business better. It'll just find troubles early, but the troubles are still there and they keep coming back again and again. So that's uh, what we're trying to achieve. Uh, the optimal selection of our choices that produce the lowest cost and highest reliability uh, forevermore. What did I? Yes, in, in, I guess what I'm saying with this slide here is, yeah, that is our focus in Planet Equipment's Wellness. This column here, proactive prevention of failure is our focus. Being reactive, our, our plan B, need to have plan B, but it, it's not going to make the company a successful world leader. Now, world leaders are not having problems. That's why they're world leaders. They're, making, they're, not, they're doing their business and it's not losing money, it's making money. Here, I've got to spend money to some degree. Always, it's the same story. We're trying to bring variation down so that the outcomes of the processes we put in place always deliver reliability. So we're just playing this game. That's the game we're really playing. We're trying to control variation. It will always be there, but if we can manage the variation to within the boundaries, that is a good result, then that's a great process. So we're trying to find this outcome using these different tools and methodologies available to us. When we go back to our, our failure curves, we know why machines fail. Now, we understand all the engineering, all the science. So we've had the answers out there. Now I've got to put the answers into practice in the business. So early life failure, we know it's a quality control issue. There are errors being made to the machine. Now, these are brand new machines, brand new parts that are failing very, very early in their life. Uh, so there are factors there we have to control. In the random failure zone, there are things we can do to minimise the chance, to, to drop that line down lower and lower and lower. So we want to know what those are and, and apply them sensibly. And as things get older and things do age, we want to recognise that it's time to change them, time to renew them, time to put the capital money into the business and actually put in new machines. There was a survey done back in the, in the 90s uh, of, of when, of the various nationalities and various practices adopted across in different countries of when they renew their machines. Uh, what the average time was in Japan was every four years they would on average replace their machines with new ones. Uh, they found in Australia it was about every eight or nine years we'd, we, we'd replace our machine with a new one. In USA it ended up being about I think about the six to seven years was the average across the, uh, across the country. Why were the Japanese replacing it machines every four years. Because four-year-old machine, it's not a very old machine. But you think about what's happening in that, in that decision to replace machines fairly often. Every time they put a new model in, that new model has solved many of the old model's problems. It's a better machine design. The machine, of course, is newer. All the parts are brand new parts. So they're restarting the fatigue life at time zero every four years. Uh, they're getting the latest technology, the latest solutions, the newest computer software. Every four years, they're always renewing to the very latest possibilities available for that operation. Whereas if you wait eight years and nine years and 10 years, you must be falling behind the game all the time. The longer you wait to replace your assets with a, the latest asset, the more opportunities you've lost because the technology that was available four years ago, you haven't used that technology. So yes, this understanding that, hey, maybe strategically it's worth intentionally putting capital aside to replace machines early on purpose to adopt the very best current solutions could be smart business. 
The point is the answers are out there. There's nothing here that's magical or new. What we, are, what we cannot see is when to apply the answer because it's too nebulous. And if we can change that into a very clear decision-making process, then, then we're going to get some good decisions made. Finally, or, or what will come out of this whole methodology is a matching of what risks there are with our options to handle those risks. Here I've talked about only the maintenance options. I've talked about uh, high consequence, uh, low likelihood when it's a big impact and it's a real disaster. We might choose to design that out. Don't have to because there are other things I can do. I can add on 24-7 uh, on, on board monitoring and monitor the situation in that machine continuously on a screen watching to see what's happening in the internals of that machine. And I can also add on top of that precision maintenance. So I don't have to have design and maintenance or design out as the only choice. I have other tools in my maintenance tool strategy kit to apply. But the whole point is we're going to match what we do with the risk to drive that risk lower. And in doing that, we free up the money that we are now losing because we're not doing the right things. So yeah, we're not doing new things, we're just doing the right things for the situation that we've now realised is actually happening in that business. Another way of having that matrix or having that previous slide and, and showing it is, is a table like this. Yeah? Likelihood of failure and different strategies depending upon the risk involved. There's many ways to cut this and, and a lot of documentation out there to, to justify using different techniques. You know, breakdown maintenance may be okay. If the cost of a breakdown is, is not expensive, it's no big deal to the business, well, we'll let it break. I'm not against breakdown maintenance, but it's got to be used at the right place. I can't have breakdown maintenance in a high risk scenario. That, that just doesn't make any business sense. If I'm putting people's lives at risk by having breakdown or active maintenance, uh, in these days, that would get you put in jail. It's just not the way you, you do things. So, yes, we don't have many tools, but we have enough to, to match it with uh, what we're trying to achieve for the business. The big one, the one that's vital, is precision maintenance. Now, this one applies everywhere. I was in uh, Japan back in 2004 at Sumitomo Chemicals in Japan, and uh, they were showing us their plant. We walked past a, a pump, and the pump was cavitating. And... Uh, I took us. I knew what was going on. It was a hot process, and it was the temperature was high, and it was creating the cavitation um, situation. Anyway, we walked past the pump, and we walked through the plant, come back through the same door an hour later. An hour later, at, at this point, there's a technician putting his tools away back in his tool kit, and uh, he'd replaced the entire wet end of the pump because uh, it was quicker to put a new wet in, new wet end in, than than to pull the whole thing apart and and, and repair it in situ. I asked the uh, guy showing us around, oh, condition monitoring for this particular pump, what condition monitoring do you do? He says, we don't do any. Now, this pump's a critical pump in their process. No condition monitoring. You know, my, my, I'm very curious as to why you don't have condition monitoring on this critical piece of kit. Well, he says, the reason we don't have condition monitoring is our technicians are all precision maintenance technicians. They use precision maintenance te techniques to very high quality standards. We are doing everything humanly possible to have this machine run trouble free for a long, long time. Condition monitoring can give us no more value. He says, all we do is the operator walks past this spot every now and again, listening for problems. So we don't have any high tech vibration analysis of the bearings because it will give us no more value. The thing's properly aligned, perfectly installed, no soft foot problems. It's humanly as far as we can go. Why waste more money and time on stuff that will add no value? And of course, that changed my view of the world of maintenance. You're saying you can do that, you can, you can actually approach maintenance in that way there, have perfection and have high, qu high quality installation and use your operators to monitor uh, the, the, the ongoing operation of that plant. Yeah, change my view of, of what's possible. And uh, it made precision maintenance and the reduction of stress a big important factor in successful businesses because he's right. We can do nothing more if things are now perfectly installed. And the process, of course, is perfectly operated. I mean, we can't forget the process control requirements too. So in this case here, um, we discussed this before, we can actually model our various risks. Now, our choices of doing things and not doing things, I can make them visible now. And real money or, or money that's justifiable value can be shown to people. 
This is also a risk cost calculator. This one here is a, a different approach, same concept. Now here's the event now. This is in fact the risk cost calculator for this scenario here. Just playing with, you know, what, with what ifs. So we are right here now. This is the current situation. Um, if I do an immediate repair, here's the current cost. If I wait a week, here's the consequences. If I can put it, put it off to the shutdown, then I can also look at the financial impacts. On this side here, I'm looking at if I'm unlucky and I can't stretch things long enough, what are the outcomes if there's a fire? I'm going to lose $2 million. If there's a rip belt, I'm going to lose $200,000. So now I'm playing with what I can do and here's the money that's hanging out there, depending upon what I do. So this is just another way to, to make it clear to people, look, this is the world you're in right now. Because that's a seized bearing and that, that roller's nearly at the knife edge condition, you've got about, you're playing with a few days of grace. After those few days, things start getting bad. I will not tell you for sure you're going to lose that belt. I'm just saying the opportunity now is there. And the longer you wait, the more likelihood bad things are going to happen. So I've got to make that clear to guys. And, and uh, this is one way. You know, that's another way to do it. None of which is hard. None of which, every which, all of which is believable, understandable and very clear as to our choices. In the end of all this, we're going to come down with our decisions. Now, this particular example here is our pump. The failure event is the, the pump bearings fail. They fail every couple of years historically. Uh, here's the cost of a failure, $35,000. Um, what am I going to do to reduce the risk? Here's a bunch of things I can do. What will that do? What are the improvements I expect? And I'm going to be fairly detailed. So I'm going to use a, a good number of words here intentionally so that when I come back to this in a few years' time, it's clear what I meant, the particular phase in time. When will I do these things? What's the cost of doing these things? And of course, the big question, what's the value in the reduction of these things? What, what will I get by doing these things? So in this case, the failure interval, uh, well, it was a two-year failure interval because we didn't do any laser aligning of our shafts. Once I have laser aligning, I expect to have a five-year period between failures of those bearings because I put in a better process. Everything is aligned, base plate's right, there's no soft foot, it's properly controlled. Because it's precision maintained and precision aligned, I expect, I expect five years. So now that, that's two and a half failures, one and a half failures we don't have. One and a half failures is 35,000 plus a, uh, another, another 15, $50,000 I'm saving by, by doing this. So I can very quickly come up with dollar values of the sense of doing this. So yeah, it becomes, it becomes, I wouldn't say an onerous process, it takes time to do this thing and, and to think through and to write the words and to have a fair representation of the real cost of, of, the, of doing that and, and its payback. But it's very clear, at the end of all this, yeah, this, this is going to pay money. This is well worth doing. And that means I've got to buy the kit, I've got to train my guys and I've got to retrain them on a regular basis every year. Is that worth doing? Well, I think it is because the money is there. Same story, is what we're going to do actually going to produce financial value? So that previous table, I can model it on this particular diagram here and visually show the change this should bring. And if it doesn't bring that change in a couple of years, I go back and say, well, hang on, we, we have, have we done the right things? Have we missed something important? And if we aren't getting the full value that we expect to return, then I've got to challenge what is different to what we thought was going to happen. All this is, it's a repeat of our previous slide. And this is simply saying if we have low risks, uh, we don't expect to have many problems, we can't justify high expense. But we can justify low cost ways of observing those risks. So if I think a risk is, I don't want to live with that risk without knowing how it's performing, how it's behaving, but I can't justify paying big dollars for that, then I want to find some low cost ways. This is the story of, of Sumitomo Chemicals. You know, they, they used the operator and his experience and his knowledge to monitor that critical pump because that was all they needed. There's no point doing more. That risk was as low as they could drive it. 
We had precision maintenance practices. It was installed correctly, as best as humanly possible. All that was left now is to watch and monitor this with a low cost technique. In that case, it was the operator who knew his plant and knew his machine. So yeah, we're, we're gonna do smart things. He's gonna know what those smart things are. Uh, uh, on that pump issue, he needs to change alloys to get something that won't cavitate. That would be a fair question to ask as a long-term solution. Today, right now, with the cavitation he's got, he's got to fix his trouble today. But he's but, just putting the same pump back in, which will cavitate again. That particular process had, um, had um, caustic soda, and, and the, it, it crystallises at a certain temperature, and what was happening was the caustic soda was crystallising and, and blocking up the pipework, basically. There were process issues that caused that. It wasn't worth them changing the whole process. This is an issue they're going to live with and minimise the inconvenience as low as possible and minimise the costs because it's never going to go away. It's the process was chosen by the engineers 25 years ago and they're stuck with it. But they can minimise the impact by making some smart choices. And that's what happens in the real world. You know? What we're trying to do here is, is help companies see the smart choice, see the smart practices to adopt and, and go ahead and do those because that's the best they can do. So we're going to optimise the choices and that's all we can ever do for them. If we can't get back to the design phase and actually question the design and ask them to find a better solution on the drawing board, what we can do is optimise as best we can.